Ubo Sothla by Clark Ashton Smith. Enjoy. For Ubo Sothla is the source and the end, before the coming of Zathakwa or Yak Zathar, or Cthulhu from the stars. Ubo Sathla dwelt in the steaming fens of the new-made earth, a mass without head or members, spawning the grey, formless Fs of the Prime and the grisly prototypes of terrene life. And all earthly life, it is told, shall go back at last through the great circle of time to Ubo Sathla, the Book of Ibon. Paul Tregardus found the milky crystal in a litter of oddments from many lands and eras. He had entered the shop of the curio dealer through an aimless impulse, with no particular object in mind, other than the idle distraction of eyeing and fingering a miscellany of far-gathered things. Looking desultorily about, his attention had been drawn by a dull glimmering on one of the tables and he had extricated the queer orb-like stone from its shadowy, crowded position between an ugly little Aztec idol, the fossil egg of a Dianoris, and an obscene fetish of black wood from the Niger. The thing was about the size of a small orange, and was slightly flattened at the ends, like a planet at its poles. It puzzled Trigardus, for it was not like an ordinary crystal, being cloudy and changeable with an intermittent glow at its heart, as if it were alternately illumined and darkened from within. Holding it to the wintry window, he studied it for a while without being able to determine the secret of its singular and regular alternation. His puzzlement was soon complicated by a dawning sense of vague and irrecognizable familiarity, as if he had seen the thing before under circumstances that were now wholly forgotten. He appealed to the curio dealer, a dwarfish Hebrew with an air of dusty antiquity who gave the impression of being lost to commercial considerations in some web of Kabbalistic reverie. Can you tell me anything about this? The dealer gave an indescribable, simultaneous shrug of his shoulders and his eyebrows. It is very old, Pelagian, one might say. I cannot tell you much, for little is known. A geologist found it in Greenland, beneath glacial ice, in the Miocene strata. Who knows, it may have belonged to some sorcerer, primeval thule. Greenland was a warm, fertile region beneath the sun of Miocene times. No doubt it is a magic crystal, and a man might behold strange visions in his heart, if he looked long enough. Trigardus was quite startled for the dealer's apparently fantastic suggestion had brought to mind his own delvings in a branch of obscure lore, and, in particular, had recalled the Book of Ibon, that strangest and rarest of occult forgotten volumes which is said to have come down through a series of manifold translations from a prehistoric original written in the lost language of Hyperborea. Trigardus, with much difficulty, had obtained the medieval French version, a copy that had been owned by many generations of sorcerers and Satanists, but had never been able to find the Greek manuscript from which the version was derived. The remote, fabulous original was supposed to have been the work of a great Hyperborean wizard, from whom it had taken its name. It was a collection of dark and baleful myths, of liturgies, rituals, and incantations both evil and esoteric not without shudders, in the course of studies that the average person would have considered more than singular, Trigardus had collated the French volume with the frightful Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al -Azred. He had found many correspondences of the blackest and most appalling significance, together with much forbidden data that was either unknown to the Arab, or omitted by him, or by his translators. Was this what he had been trying to recall, Trigardus wondered, the brief, casual reference in the Book of Ibon to a cloudy crystal that had been owned by the wizard Zon Mazamolik in Muthulon? Of course, it was all too fantastic, too hypothetic, too incredible, 
but Muthulon, that northern portion of ancient Hyperborea, was supposed to have corresponded roughly with modern Greenland, which had formerly been joined as a peninsula to the main continent. Could the stone in his hand, by some fabulous fortuity, be the crystal of Zon Mesomolic? Tregardus smiled at himself with inward irony for even conceiving the absurd notion. Such things did not occur, at least not in present-day London. In all likelihood, the Book of Ibon was sheer superstitious fantasy anyway. Nevertheless, there was something about the crystal that continued to tease and inveigle him. He ended by purchasing it at a fairly moderate price. The sum was named by the seller and paid by the buyer without bargaining. With the crystal in his pocket, Paul Tregardus hastened back to his lodgings instead of resuming his leisurely saunter. He installed the milky globe on his writing table, where it stood firmly enough on one of its oblate ends. Then, still smiling at his own absurdity, he took down the yellow parchment manuscript of the Book of Ibon from its place in a somewhat inclusive collection of recherche literature. He opened the vermiculated leather cover with hasps of tarnished steel and read over to himself, translating from the archaic French as he read, the paragraph that referred to Zon Mesomolic. This wizard, who was mighty among sorcerers, had found a cloudy stone, orb-like and somewhat flattened at the ends, in which he could behold many visions of the Turin past, even to the Earth's beginning, when Ubo Sathla, the unbegotten source, lay vast and swollen and yeasty amid the vaporing slime. But of that which he beheld, Zon Mesomolic left little record, and people say that he vanished presently in a way that is not known, and after him the cloudy crystal was lost. Paltrogardus laid the manuscript aside. Again there was something that tantalized and beguiled him, like a lost dream or a memory forfeit to oblivion. Impelled by a feeling which he did not scrutinize or question, he sat down before the table and began to stare intently into the cold, nebulous orb. He felt an expectation which, somehow, was familiar, so permeative a part of his consciousness that he did not even name it to himself. Minute by minute he sat and watched the alternate glimmering and fading of the mysterious light in the heart of the crystal. By imperceptible degrees there stole upon him a sense of dreamlike duality, both in respect to his person and his surroundings. He was still Paul Tregardus, and yet he was someone else. The room was his London apartment, and a chamber in some foreign but well-known place and in both milieus he peered steadfastly into the same crystal. After an interim, without surprise on the part of Jagardus, the process of re-identification became complete. He knew that he was Zon Mesomolic, a sorcerer of Muthulon, and a student of all lore and tyria of his own epoch. Wise and dreadful secrets that were not known to Paul Tregardus, amateur of anthropology and occult sciences in latter-day London, he sought by means of the milky crystal to attain an even older and more fearful knowledge. He had acquired the stone in dubitable ways from a more than sinister source. It was unique and without fellow in any land or time. In its depths, all former years, all things that have ever been, were supposedly mirrored and would reveal themselves to a patient visionary. And through the crystal, Zon Mesomolic had dreamt to recover the wisdom of the gods who died before the earth was born. They had passed to the lightless void, leaving their lore inscribed upon tablets of ultra-stellar stone, and the tablets were guarded in a primal mire by the formless, idiotic demiurge, Ubo Sothla. Only by means of the crystal could he hope to find and read the tablets. For the first time he was making trial of the globe's reputed virtues. About him an ivory-paneled chamber, filled with his magic books and paraphernalia, was fading slowly from his consciousness. 
Before him, on a table of some dark hyperborean wood that had been graven with grotesque ciphers, the crystal appeared to swell and deepen, and in its filmy depth he beheld a swift and broken swirling of dim scenes, fleeting like the bubbles of a mill race. As if he had looked upon an actual world, cities, forests, mountains, seas and meadows flowed beneath him, lightning and darkening as with the passage of days and nights in some weirdly accelerated stream of time. Zon Mesomolik had forgotten Paul Tregardus, had lost the remembrance of his own entity and his own surroundings in Muthulon. Moment by moment, the flowing vision in the crystal became more definite and distinct, and the orb itself deepened till he grew giddy, as if he were peering from an insecure height into some never-fathomed abyss. He knew that time was racing backward in the crystal, was unrolling for him the pageant of all past days, but a strange alarm had seized him, and he feared to gaze longer. Like one who has nearly fallen from a precipice, he caught himself from a violent start and drew back from the mystic orb. Again, to his gaze, the enormous whirling world into which he appeared was a small and cloudy crystal on his rune-wrought table in Muthulon. Then, by degrees, it seemed that the great room with sculptured panels of mammoth ivory was narrowing to another dingier place and Zon Mesomolik, losing his preternatural wisdom and sorcerous power, went back, by a weird regression, into Paul Tregardus. And yet, not wholly, it seemed, was he able to return. Tregardus, dazed and wondering, found himself before the writing table on which he had set the Oblate Sphere. He felt the confusion of one who has dreamt and yet not fully awakened from a dream. The room puzzled him vaguely, as if something were wrong with its size and furnishings, and his remembrance of purchasing the crystal from a curio dealer was oddly and discrepantly mingled with an impression that he had acquired it in a very different manner. He felt that something very strange had happened to him when he peered into the crystal, but just what it was he could not seem to recollect. It had left him in a sort of psychic muddlement that follows a debauch of hashish. He assured himself that he was Paul Tregardus, that he lived on a certain street in London, that the year was 1932, but such commonplace verities had somehow lost their meaning and their validity, and everything about him was shadow-like and insubstantial. The very walls seemed to waver like smoke, the people on the streets were phantoms of phantoms, and he himself was a lost shadow, a wandering echo of something long forgot. He resolved that he would not repeat his experiment of crystal gazing. The effects were too unpleasant and equivocal. But the very next day, by an unreasoning impulse to which he yielded almost mechanically, without reluctation, he found himself seated before the misty orb. Again he became the sorcerer Zon Mesomolok in Muthulon. Again he dreamt to retrieve the wisdom of the anti-mundane gods. Again he drew back from the deepening crystal with the terror of one who fears to fall, and once more, but doubtfully and dimly, like a failing wraith, he was Paul Tregardus. Three times did Tregardus repeat the experience on successive days, and each time his own person and the world about him became more tenuous and confused than before. His sensations were those of a dreamer who was on the verge of waking, and London itself was unreal as the lands that slipped from the dreamer's ken, receding on filmy mist and cloudy light. Beyond it all, he felt the looming and crowding of vast imageries, alien but half-familiar. It was as if the phantasmagoria of time and space were dissolving about him to reveal some veritable reality or another dream of space and time. There came at last the day that he sat down before the crystal, and did not return as Paul Tregardus. It was the day when Zon Mesomolik, boldly disregarding certain evil and portentous warnings, resolved to overcome his curious fear of falling bodily into the visionary world that he beheld, a fear that had hitherto prevented him from following the backward stream of time for any distance. He must, he assured himself, conquer this fear if he were to ever see and read the lost tablets of the gods. 
He had beheld nothing more than a few fragments of the years of Muthulon, immediately posterior to the present, the years of his own lifetime, and there were inestimable cycles between these years and the beginning. Again to his gaze the crystal deepened immeasurably, with scenes and happenings that flowed in a retrograde stream. Again the magic ciphers of the dark table faded from his kin, and the sorcerously carven walls of his chamber melted into less than a dream. Once more he grew giddy with an awful vertigo as he bent above the swirling and milling of the terrible gulfs of time in the world-like orb. Fearfully, in spite of his resolution, he would have drawn away, but he had looked and leaned too long. There was a sense of abysmal falling, a suction as of inelocutable winds, of maelstroms that bore him down through fleet, unstable visions of his own past life into antenatal years and dimensions. He seemed to endure the pangs of an inverse dissolution, and then he was no longer Zon Mesomalak, the wise and learned watcher of the crystal, but an actual part of the weirdly racing stream that ran back to reattain the beginning. He seemed to live unnumbered lives, to die myriad deaths, forgetting each time the death and life that had gone before. He fought as a warrior in half-legendary battles. He was a child playing in the ruins of some olden city of Muthulon. He was the king that had reigned when the city was in its prime, the prophet who had foretold its building and its doom. A woman, he wept for the bygone dead in necropoli long crumbled. An antique wizard, he muttered the rude spells of earlier sorcery. A priest of some pre-human god, he wielded the sacrificial knife in cave temples of pillared basalt. Life by life, Era by era, he retraced the long and groping cycles through which Hyperborea had arisen from savagery to high civilization. He became a barbarian of some troglodytic tribe, fleeing from the slow, turreted ice of a formal glacial age into lands illumined by the ruddy flare of perpetual volcanoes. Then, after incomputable years, he was no longer man, but a man-like beast, roving in forests of giant fern and calamite, or building an uncouth nest in the boughs of mighty cycads. Through aeons of anterior sensation, of crude lust and hunger, of aboriginal terror and madness, there was someone or something that went ever backward in time. Death became birth, and birth was death. In a slow vision of reverse change, the earth appeared to melt away and sloughed off the hills and mountains of its later strata. Always the sun grew larger and hotter above the fuming swamps that teemed with a crasser life, with a more fulsome vegetation. And the thing that had been Paul Tregardus, that had been Zon Mesomalek, was a part of all the monstrous devolution. It flew like the claw-tip wings of a pterodactyl. It swam in tepid seas with the vast, winding bulk of the ichthyosaurus. It bellowed uncouthly with the armored throat of some forgotten behemoth to the huge moon that burned the primordial mists. At length, after aeons of immemorial brutehood, it became one of the lost serpent men who reared their cities of black Nice and fought their venomous wars in the world's first continent. It walked undulously in the anti-human streets, in strange, crooked vaults. It peered at primeval stars from high Babalian towers. It bowed with hissing litanies to the great serpent idols. Through years and ages of the Ophidian era it returned, and was a thing that crawled in the ooze, that had not yet learned to think and dream and build. And the time came there was no longer a continent, but only a vast chaotic marsh, a sea of slime without limit or horizon, without shore or elevation, that seethed with a blind writhing of amorphous vapors. There, in the grey beginnings of Earth, the formless mass that was Ubo Sathla reposed amid the slime and the vapors. Headless, without organs or members, it sloughed from its oozy sides in a slow and ceaseless wave the amoebic forms that were the archetypes of earthly life. 
horrible it was if there had been aught to apprehend the horror, and loathsome if there had been any to feel loathing. About it, prone or tilted in the mire, there lay the mighty tablets of star-quarried stone that were writ with the inconceivable wisdom of the pre-mundane gods. And there, to the goal of a forgotten search, was drawn the thing that had been, or would sometime be, Paul Tregardus and Zon Mesomalek. Becoming a shapeless eft of the prime, it crawled sluggishly and obliviously across the fallen tablets of the gods, and fought and ravened blindly with the other spawn of Ubo Sothla. Of Zon Mesomalek and his vanishing there is no mention anywhere save a brief passage in the Book of Ibon. Concerning Paul Tregardus, who also disappeared, there was a curt notice in several of the London papers. No one seems to have known anything about him. He is gone as if he had never been, and the crystal, presumably, is gone too. At least, no one has found it.